now for the shop report with What up, sports fans? Welcome to the Shop Report. I'm Barbershop J. I'll be your host for the day. Here's what's happening. If you're up and around, you're out and about, and you want to give us a shout, that number to call is area code 267-687-0026. Once again, the number to call, area code 267-687-0026. And as always, we'd like to remind the folks out there that the Shop Report is now being powered by None other than Rocket Digital Media, or should I say the fine folks over at Rocket Digital Media, excuse me. It's the one-stop shop for all your digital marketing needs. You can look them up on Facebook at RDM Detroit. Once again, at RDM Detroit, or you can go to their website, rocketdigital.net. That's R-O-C-K-I-T digital.net, and tell them BSJ sent you. Joining us on the P program today is none other than my cat from the NYC, aka Rucker Park, brother Rich. What's happening? I'm I'm always honored and humbled to be on the show with you. I'm here to report a sighting. It's been reported by some good people out there in Dallas that there was a wretched mule being beaten to it, to be oh. beaten to it in the inch of its life mm. on Arlington Way. I, I heard the address is. Uh, one AT&T way in Arlington, there was a rented mule getting beaten by somebody in a Browns jersey uh, last Sunday. Did you hear anything about that down there in Dallas? No, I didn't. <laughs> I'm not from Dallas. I don't live in Dallas. <laughs> I used to live in Dallas. I no, don't claim Dallas. We got my man D. Gully from the CO Lum bus joining us. Gully, what's the deal? Everything, man. How you guys doing? We all good. Yeah. Uh, I don't know where this Dallas reference comes from, but Gully, before you say anything, uh, I want to go to the other side of the ledger and introduce my man from up north, Joey James, a.k.a. Double J. Tell the people what you say. Well, it's a victory Tuesday, and for that, we're going to go to George Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, thanks for that nice little uh, interlude. But before we get into any of today's topics, I was just informed prior to coming on the air here, I just wanted to let the people know that Brother Rich and Double J, due to the fact that the Browns beat the Cowboys in the figment of their imagination that I'm so much a fan of, they decided to do a little skit for us today, a vaudevillian act of so, or sorts. So, which one of you vaudevillians would like to go first? Brother Rich, Double J, anybody? <laughs> oh, now y'all don't have nothing to say. Well, I don't know who you're calling vaudevillians. I know we, in the course of this program, we intend to remind the listeners of this wonderful program that our beloved host here, who we love and admire uh-huh. and hold in tremendously high regard, yeah. back to losing yeah. game, while at the same time he continues to pile on the Cleveland Browns, who is a relatively... Oh, hold it hold, it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. No, 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 no. No, 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 Helen. No, the Helen. No, no, no. You're not going to sit here and s- right. tell one side of the story. Who sends you all information about the Browns? Who sends you well, all information? Of you do, because with, because, because what? of course you do. You run a sports program. You got you have you have people that listen to you. This is what you do. This is a this is the business element of what you do. You don't do it from your fandom. You probably resent Double J and I anticipate that you resent sending us any good. You know when you send us something a good text on the brown, we anticipate the stock market is gonna drop. Our conservative friend in Columbus probably panics. When you say something good about the Browns, because something that means something is off in the world. The stock market is about to crash. Okay, got you. This is what we're talking about. This gotcha. is what we're under a constant barrage from you, sir. As we got a live one Browns. here, don't we? Yeah. D- listen, yeah. Do you hold on, hold on, hold on. Absolutely. Do you hear? Do you hear the words he's using? A barrage. But yet and still, when we come yeah. on the air, it's him and Double J attacking me. <laughs> but I'm the one with the barrage. <laughs> what have no, this, I? This, this absolutely is not an attack. Oh, this, please. This is a, Oh my gosh! This is born out of this is born out of pent up brown fans. Oh, emotion and oh. actually rage at fans, oh. at, at teams and fans like the Cowboys Nation, who you all back them simply because of some colors that you grew up liking in your childhood, and because you grew up at a time, unfortunately, when.
when the Browns were losers, now that the new generation of Browns fans are riding with this underdog team, and they are now coming into their own prominence while the top, the Cowboys stayed into the back, John Wayne, while they stayed off into the back. Oh, the my. Sunset, with, uh, Jerry Jones, uh, Lil Jerry, while they wow. stayed off into the back, and, and Baker Mayfield and Miles Garrett and that crew, and Odell Beckham is returning into prominence again. That's what we need to spend this whole entire show talking about, that team down there on Lake Erie that nobody's paying attention to. Okay, got you. Well, apparently you are paying attention to, that is. But did you hear Did you hear what he said, Gully, about Cowboys fans and us growing up as fans? Really? <laughs> That's what I'm trying to tell yeah, you? Right, yeah. Yeah, you know, I'm trying to tell you, yeah, like, yeah, we, yeah, okay. Did you, did you hear that sound? Did you, you hear that sound? In this case, <laughs> that's the people that know me that's laughing. <laughs> yeah, grew up Cowboys fan. Yeah, okay. Uh, Double J, would you, would you like to, you know, add to the, I, I'm so glad I wore my boots for today's show because <laughs> I knew this was going to be flying. You know what I mean? And he led in with that, with such an eloquent, uh, it was so great to be on the show with our beloved host and all of that. And I'm sitting here looking at my watch like, wow. I mean, you know what I'm saying? That was 30 seconds longer than what I expected. You know what I mean? And then all of a sudden, the other shoe dropped. It's okay, though. Oh, but did I say, Double J, you got something you want to say? Because <laughs> I am appalled at the stuff that just came out of Brother Richard's mouth. I do not understand the words. Go ahead, Double J. Add to the lies. Why, thank you. I have waited for this moment for quite some time. Oh, now he's a rapper. And here we go. First, Enjoy it, it my friend. Enjoy East. it. The NFC East was the toughest division in football. I and asked a question. What did the Erie Warriors go and do? Put up a 50 on them? Oh, in my In the home gosh. of Gary's world, and they kicked over your kettle? Is that why you're mad? Oh, and my gosh. <laughs> this on is, top of that. This is unbelievable. Barbershop Kozar had taken his talent south. Anytime he had given Brother Rich and I any sort of Cleveland information, it was the Rod Parker uh, ask take on it, just like the kid from Cleveland. Wow, that really? OBJ a shout really? Out wearing a cowboy hat. We see right through it. Oh We're my! It. Oh my! So so you 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 brother you and brother Rich really sticking to that, huh? The Browns information that I've given now you all. Remember. This Hold on. the same host that said Stefanski needed to get fired because he didn't know how to draft. How'd Miles Garrett I didn't do? say nothing about I didn't say nothing right. about Stefanski didn't know how to draft. What did you what? Oh yeah, y'all need to lay off the sauce. Don't let it be your boss. I didn't say nothing about Stefanski not knowing how to see this is see see when you when you tell so many lies. You know, they, it, it like interest. It becomes it's compounded. You know what I'm saying? Then you can't remember one from the other. But that's okay. If you're gonna stand, stand. If you're gonna sit, sit. But do not waver. Like these two over here, the vaudevillians. Gully, would you like to add anything to this? You know what I mean? Double J was vehement too, wasn't he? Ah, rah, 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 rah. <laughs> like- all I'm saying, all I'm saying is. I think they're hitting you harder than they're hitting me. I think they're just hitting me on. on I just, I'm just collateral damage. All I'm saying is, I will remain uh, complimentary, but rather stoic for a team that only has three winning seasons this century. Oh, don't, don't, that's oh, oh you can't tell, you can't tell these two guys nah, that. But, but, nah, that's a very low blow, uh, Gully. But we got, we're holding some ammunition. To we wanted to see what you were going to try to fire in on this. But okay, so okay, we well, won. listen, this but you. Day. Hey, is it the truth? It's a fair fight now. Okay. Is it the truth? No, it's absolute rubbish. It's rubbish. It's not. No, no, no. We're not asking. Is it trash? The Browns are a new team. The Browns are a recent team. They're not a recent team. What you mean they're a recent team? Wait, 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 wait. Baker Mayfield was a quarterback for each of the last two seasons. What are you talking about? It's a recent team. Are you serious? We're talking about an in- I, I'm absolutely being serious. We're talking about a young quarterback who had a fairly good rookie campaign, who got too big for his britches his second year, who in his third year is showing some of the promise he showed in his first year, and the players, just as Double J pointed out to us, this is a team that drafted recently, and we know that in the NFL, sometimes it takes a, a year or two for your draft pick, sometimes three, for your draft class to come around, this 
draft class and this team that was put together about three years ago is now coming around. Baker is having his best season yet. He's and now speaking like of the number three, Gully facts. just told These you that facts. three. Yeah, it's a fact, but it's also a fact that the Browns have had three winning seasons. That's a fact too. So Gully, so Gully, you. You okay, so Gully, so what it is is when brother when brother Richard and Double J say it, it's 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 something to be discussed. Oh, stop it! And eat sushi and talk about the stock market and and look down on yeah. the, uh, the, the the black people who are kneeling for their rights. Oh man, really, really, seriously, seriously, you all the Cowboys yeah. not want anything in seriously. probably thirty years. Probably yeah, 30 years. yeah, this is this is. 30. This is, so, you know, I, I just want to point this out here. Oh. It, it, the pot calling the kettle red when the Cowboys haven't won a playoff game since pre-2000 either. So, it, we, yeah, hold on. Whoa, 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 whoa. See, so, see, no, 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 no. No, no, no. This is, this is where you all are misconstruing things. We, he said three winning seasons. You're going to say when the Cowboys haven't won a playoff game. Playoff games and regular seasons are not one and the same. Stop it. Stop Stop trying to blend the line. You know, y'all, okay, I, I see who y'all rooting for in tonight's uh, NBA Finals. But I'm not even talking about, we're not even talking about playoff games. When the Cowboys play for playoff games? The Cowboys are built for the playoffs? I'm no. The are the I'm, I'm talking players. about. They're supposed to be built for, for how, many, how, many, how many trophies do they have? I have how no many idea. How trophies do they have? I, mean, I, know, I have no idea. I have no, I know how many. You that Gully is comparing the Browns and the Cowboys and the, and the Time that he's comparing those two teams, one a new team, one in essence is a spot. Is it, it really? They're only a new spot. team in your the mind. Browns Wait, the Browns are not new. Wait one minute. Okay, hold on. No, let me let you finish that. No, no, he, he ain't gonna. No, he team. gonna because it's the some of the same stuff. It's jargon. Gully, 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 let me ask you a question. It's hog. When it's did rubbish. The Browns come back to Cleveland. When did the Browns come back to Cleveland? 1999. Okay, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. I got this. I know this. The Browns came back, if you will, to Cleveland in 1999. Correct. The Carolina Panthers were in the Super Bowl five years later. The Baltimore Ravens. Matters not. Matters not. Why? Matters not. Because in the same 20 years, we've had had every single – listen, every single franchise – Here's why it matters not. Here's why it matters not. Because this conversation was not a comparison between the Carolina Panthers and the Cleveland Browns. If that's what you want to switch it to, I will defer. He's not comparison. He's making a point, which we are allowed to do here. What we were talking about was America's team who don't win anything, who the Browns are. are, If I were wagering, I would bet on the Browns being a winner before I would bet on the Cowboys. And any good football person would tell you that in my humble estimation. And I'm the least knowledgeable football person on this show and probably of okay. all of our – Okay, well, guess what? Guess what? Guess what? Whatever, whatever the Cowboys – whatever the Cowboys are going – that team is trash. Whatever the Cowboys, whatever the Cowboys, you could, whatever the Cowboys are going through now, the Browns have been there and done you that. Got, you got the first, the, the, foot, the, the, the Cowboys have the first, Double J, correct me if I'm wrong. You, you, you do the numbers better than us. You're the numbers person. Oh, correct boy. me if I'm wrong that the Cowboys have the first multi-billion dollar stadium. I know we have one out here in L.A. now that's going to rival everything else. We set the, the new record, but the Cowboys, to my understanding, have the first, uh, billion dollar stadium, and mind you, let's let's let let me plug L.A. Let's plug L.A. Let's plug the Rams right here in Inglewood, the beautiful stadium that we have out here that is reportedly costing five billion dollars. The Rams are already on the rise, so we see their money look like it has a future. We don't know what the Cowboys investing their money in. They're just throwing their money in an oil well in a, in some ditch in Dallas. Got you. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. He wow. Woo, boy. You hear that, Gully? Yeah. We're gonna save this for later. I, I, I've got more, but I think, I think, in the interest of time, our moderator wants us. To yeah, to you know what I mean. But I got I, something I, for you, brother Rich. Yeah, because uh, I, I just we well, just you know, we just. On, Gully, I, I do want to just say that you know it's convenient that when when Baltimore took the existing Browns franchise, that that first draft they were gifted two Hall of Famers and Jonathan Ogden and Ray Lewis. 
So I, I don't want to hear after that Gifted? everything else. What do you mean? They, no. That's not a fact. Oh, oh, oh. Hey, oh, oh, oh. Hey, 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 hey. See? Okay, listen. Do not do not go there. <laughs> you don't want to go there. Because I'm telling you right now, they won, I, me and Herm did this experiment six years ago. Because he wanted to know how many dudes Ozzy drafted that was that was guys that was either undrafted, like I think Jermaine Lewis or some of them. But we was we had this little experiment, and I put I went to Pro Football Reference and I put up every roster since '96 and all of the players that Ozzy drafted, guys some that you knew and guys that you didn't know, but who made Pro Bowls and and All Pros and all that old kind of stuff. Jonathan Ogden was not gifted to the Ravens. He was not. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. Overall, Jay. What do you mean he wasn't gifted? He was not oh, gifted. What, how, much, how wrong would they have been with, with, uh, with Simeon Rice at three? Come on. He was not gifted. The, do you know who we, – we already had this conversation. I'm not going to go down this road right now because so, we got to get into the other stuff we got to discuss today. But uh, the last thing is they, the Ravens were supposed to draft a running back that year. They already had they right tackle and they left tackle in place. I think it was Wally Williams and Tony Jones. Remember we had we had this discussion. Tony Jones went to the uh, Pro Bowl from both sides of the line. He played left tackle and right tackle. It was no need based on if you draft him for need for Ozzy to draft Jonathan Ogden, but he had a plan in place. Ogden was not gifted to the Ravens. Stop it. I done already did this assignment years ago. You don't want to do that. <laughs> you don't want to do that. 25, more, 25 other teams had an opportunity. To Thank you. Ray Lewis, by the way. Thank you. In 96. You, y'all don't. Oh, don't well, you know, when, don't when do it. Guys like Eddie George and uh, who, who else was in that same draft there? Marvin Harrison. I mean, it's a slim picking, uh, you know, it, it, clearly. But that's – but the but – the, well, I don't know, but we'll go back through that draft. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Since since we're talking about the new Browns and all that kind of stuff, I don't see how you can separate one from another. This ain't Baltimore and Indianapolis. They still the Colts. But anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to have a tr- Browns trivia for you two, the Vaudevillians. And I will not send a text prior to the show on what the subject or the trivia questions will be. We're going to see how much and let the people decide that how much of a Browns that fans. Prove that you know. you, uh, but I wouldn't challenge your knowledge on any team. No, 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 no. You are, no, 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 no. You, no, no, no. Know, you know sports. You, you're one of the most knowledgeable sports people I know that any of us know. No, so no, no. I'm going to keep it. I'm, I'm going to keep it first grade. What does that mean? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give I, y'all a trick. You, you, are, you all are professional. I've been a Laker fan. I don't know Laker trivia, but I, I know I know Kobe trivia, but I may not know Laker tri- what trivia. What I'm saying is, so, that doesn't mean, so you 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 may know Brown trivia. What does that mean? No, 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 no. And we're gonna see how so you you, 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 you you all are professing to be. You all are profess. You and Double J are professing to be these Browns. Th- this fandom is so strong. We're gonna see how much y'all know. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, well, and, 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 and based on again the, the, the top of conversation here, we're talking about a 20 year old team. Because I said no. I said in the. I said in. He said no. Brother Rich said. Brother Rich said the Browns are a new team. I'm going. I'm going to go back just three years. NFL, that's a new team. I'm just going to go what, back three the years. Browns are a new team compared to the Dallas Cowboys. Double day, double day. The, the Browns have are not. When you say new, see here's the thing, right? Here's what, here's here, you did it again. You did it again. In you comparison to the Dallas Cowboys, who the and it's the comparison that we are using for this. The beginning of this program today is the Browns versus the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, as opposed to the Dallas Cowboys as a franchise, they are a team that was an original team. They've been around. The, 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 the Cleveland Browns are a new team. And if the Cleveland Browns did not have a political situation, and we know now, history records it, we know what it was. Oh it was a political gosh. situation. It, was, it didn't have anything to do with the team, per se. They, all they did was move the team a few hundred miles down the road and assemble the same team and then win a Super Bowl uh, the next year. That, that's the Browns. And, and so the fan oh. base in Cleveland said at the beginning, that's our Super Bowl. Well, because you can say, but you can say that, that about the Browns now. You can say that for 20 years they've been a new team. They changed regimes like, like he said, I changed clothes. 
They've been changing how, to do how they a new of team. Course, of course, but 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 but, but that is a, that that is not. A, I could explain that. We could, the fan uh. base, the loyal fan, can explain that. That's not a result of the the players. That's a result of the politics of the team. Who who who's the owner? Well, they're not who, a new who, team. Uh, they just have a new who, regime who, 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 this who, week. That's what's new. Because if they were a new team, they'd have a new name, which is what they should have did well, when I they came what's back. New. What's new is oh, that butt whooping we put on the Cowboys this time. Oh, that was okay. a new belt we put up on okay. their Now we used a new belt to beat their behind. Okay, got you. That, All right. You know, In our, yeah, that was some yeah. of that fun. That is there. That is there. Okay. Stockyards there. Hmm? Okay. But, but, that is but, but Gully, they act and like they were. Also week, and it's also week five. <laughs> yeah, but they and they act like they they t- talking cash money now. They act like they wasn't constipated in the fourth quarter. Listen, you know what I'm saying? Let, they called let, me let a couple of times back. talking about you, do you got some suppositories on hand? Up, let me set let, let, let me set myself up a little further. It's week five, right? So I'm going record saying like, look, I'm the I'm the week five guy. I'm the I'm the glass half empty guy. Their glass, whatever they sipping on, is still halfway there. Probably a little bit more. So we could all, me and you. Uh, barbershop, we could be eating our words in week 16. Very, very sure. But I tell you what, it's not as ripe as it will be in the rest of the season as it is right now. Whatever this is, we're going to find out what it is in week 16. But let me tell you something, Gully. Let me tell you something. Well, we, we sure will. This whole, the listen, thing, Gully, this, this, this whole this thing is a figment fan. of their imagination. It's a figment. We're going back and forth. We spent 15 minutes on the figments of, of imaginations. But you know what they say about imaginations. Sometimes it's your only nation. Well, let you me know, ask you a question. Let me tell you what's not a figment of our imagination. Okay. One team is three and one, and the other one is what? One and three. I don't, I could, or, hey, or, listen. Or, I, that's not a figment of our imagination. Hey, listen. I could care less about the Dallas Cowboys. My only that's not allegiance. That's a figment of our imagination. My only that allegiance. Not a figment of our hey, I tell you what else ain't okay. a figment of imagination either. The Miami Hurricanes is 3 and 0. Oh. Them is my boys. Now, nah, ask, anybody, that topic, ask anybody that know me who I rock them. with. Yeah, how, ask anybody who I know that know me who I rock with on the gridiron. <laughs> From sun up to sun down. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see when they when they now finally play someone. Uh, oh man, uh, stop it! Oh man, stop in, it! You can in, say uh, you can say that about the Clemson. you can say that about the Bengals in Washington hey. for the Browns too. Hey. And when hey, they finally double play day. somebody, double day, double day. They, throw, they throw in the Cowboys over more like the. the oh man, Jesus. stop it! Now all of a Very sudden, it's, it's different strokes <laughs> for different folks. It depends on who plays whom. I was a Cowboys fan. Yeah, like, exactly. But listen, Gully. I just said my fandom about the Browns is in a perspective of being a Gully. Gully, Gully you know you asked for inspired. You know you Hey, Gully. I, I know, I know. It's getting Gully. kind of warm. It's Gully. Kind of warm. Gully, you see, you see, you see how all of a sudden, you see how all of a sudden you're a Cowboys fan too. Right, they <laughs> this, just told me. I'm yeah. just like, watch. It's gonna be. It's gonna be two little. Uh, it's gonna be yeah, two kettles little or whatever they call it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Little Jerry. M- meanwhile, be me- Jerry. Me- I can already see it now. I see it. I see me- it. Meanwhile, you know because what I'm saying? Uh, hurricane that, that hit in, in Texas as well, and, and must have blew him Georgia. to Miami. I, 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 I don't know. I I just five. know. I just know one of the Browns. Uh, logos or mascots or whatever wears shoes with that curl up in the front. Anyway, um, in the first of our three games to watch, now that we done finally got to it, the Buccaneers at the Bears. This is the Thursday night game next Thursday. And there's a question, or a question I'd like to ask. Seeing that the Bucs are 3-1, and one, and what unfortunately happened to the Patriots, or what's happening to the Patriots right now, I think they're 1-2 and two or 1-3, and three, I believe they are, or I'm not sure, 1-2, and two, I believe. Or 1-3, and three, I'm sorry. Are we still asking if it's Brady or the system? Gully, we come to you first. Well, looking at where he at, um, I think it's still too early. I really do. I think it's still too early. Um, what we can say is I'm inclined to believe it was, it was the perfect symmetry balance of the two. A talent – a talent like Brady. Are you saying it's a combination of both? Say again. It's a combination of both. Yeah, it's definitely. Oh, okay, yeah, gotcha. I think I see okay. the presence of both. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
Yeah, I just I just wanted to make sure I heard you on that one right there. Are you were you done? Yeah, n- n- nothing need more to be elaborated. I'm pretty certain uh, Brother Rich has probably got a Cowboys reference and a Browns reference. Oh man, there. Um, nobody's a Stefanski. Nobody's uh, a Mayfield reference in terms of it being a balance of both. And nobody, both. yeah, I, I'm 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 going to tune in. I get my popcorn. Ready. Yeah, nobody's paying him any mind. He, Ever since he moved to the gated community and got a go to pooper scooper, now you know what I'm saying he's just flinging stuff at everybody as they pass by. Here's some for you, and here's some for you, Double J. Are we still asking if Brady, if it's Brady, excuse me, or the system? The difficulty in that, and and you know, with what Gully said specifically, is is really what I think hit, hits at home because if you're watching both of these teams and, and despite Cam not being there last night as an example, and there was a statistic that when they played Seattle, he was directly involved of 90% of the offensive play. So either he threw it or he ran it. Um, and when you take him out, and they're basically at an offensive stalemate. Um, but yet defensively, they are still very much into the game. I think what you had found was that what Brady was in terms of balance and control on the offensive side, Bill very much was that exact same uh, defensively. And that's why you had always seen all of these coaches and coordinators come and go but yet the results very much remain the same for them for, you know, nearly two decades. Um, When you look, evaluate both how Tampa's performing right now, uh, despite their three and one, I've never seen a more unimpressive five touchdown game from a quarterback in my lifetime. And with, again, with new England, whether it's COVID or a, a an injury, they are going to go as far as Cam Newton can take them, not Bill Belichick. So again, two very very different uh, situations. But you could tell, and I think it's very evident now that both needed each other uh, equally. Mm. Yeah, you think so, huh? All right, and <laughs> brother Rich, are we still asking if it's Brady or the system? Well, I'm, I'm, I've never asked that. I check the tape. I've always been on the side of the fact that it's talent. I know coaching matters. But here's, here's, here's where I'm going to tie the argument together. Talent in this wise. I believe that Belichick is a coaching talent. But Brady is not doing whatever he's doing in Tampa by accident. They weren't, they didn't have this record last year. They weren't doing this. So they weren't. A, a, a potential contender in the way they are being looked at. Now, it's interesting that he could have an unimpressive five touchdown game. Most quarterbacks in the NFL would love to have an unimpressive five touchdown game. So when you watch him play the game, you find that even in the waning years of his career, his talent is still there. Now, is he Brady? There was Belichick close enough to him to see that he wasn't as sharp as he was and he understood that football one move would rock the wrong way could be the end and then we'll be set back for several years we got to start over was there some problem there absolutely but it doesn't matter because they really could they benefited from each other and to the degree that that Brady has found a situation that he believes he can maneuver and work in and get the most out of his remaining talent it's benefiting him as well because I'm sure he doesn't mind being in Tampa this winter and kind of going along and at least having a chance. Now, we'll see what happens if Cam is not, because I don't think it's a coincidence that that Belichick got a talented quarterback to come in and run his system. He's not just getting just anybody. If he thought that it was the system, he would have stayed with Stidham. But he didn't do that. He went and got Cam Newton because he knew that you at least got to get somebody. He go to argument. Did, did, Did Bill Jackson coach talent? Did he just go coach talent? Is that what made him a great coach, or was he a great coach all of his own? Bill Jackson could see talent. He was a talent as a coach. He was a talent to put people together. I think Belichick is the same way. 
Uh, yeah, as far as the five touchdown game being unimpressive, I think that's subjective. The man is 6,500 years old. He ain't supposed to be having five right. touchdown games on no level. That's very, very subjective. Five touchdowns in any game in the NFL on any given Sunday is quite impressive, regardless of whether you're 50 or 25. Up next, the second game, I should say, in our three games to watch, the Buffalo Bills are 4-0 and at the Titans, who are 3-0. and And the question here is, is Josh Allen for real? And if I'm not mistaken, I caught the graph the other day, but I kind of didn't catch it in time. I want to say the Bills are undefeated, and what the, the actual record is, I think it's like 12-0 and or 13-0 and or something like that, when he scores at least one rushing touchdown. Brother Rich, is Josh Allen for real with these Bills? Absolutely. Absolutely. The question becomes, are the, either of these teams for real? Is Buffalo for real? Or are they the Buffalo of old, like somebody always brings up the Browns, excuse me, and never mentions the fact that the Cowboys have failed. But uh, is Buffalo for real? Are any of these teams? Oh, well, I, Buffalo, I teams the road through is, the road through uh, to the Super Bowl at one point went through Buffalo. Correct. Exactly. But what happened every time that they got there? What uh, Oh, we know the history of the the recent history. Oh, oh, okay. So you're saying that this, so this, this is not a new team. This is the old team. Okay, I'm just. Uh, oh, okay, got you. I'm just trying to figure out where we're going with this. It's all good. Double J, is Josh Allen for real? And can you verify what the record is for me? I meant to ask you that before we got on the air, uh, or Gully, one of you all. I know it's uh, this. Either some something in O. 10 and O, 14 and O, 11 and O, 12 and O, somewhere around in there. I didn't catch the whole thing in time. But again, is Josh Allen for real? I'm gonna say yes. Um the the reason why is he accomplished um a statistic that I had thought for certain <clears throat> Jim Kelly would have been uh the associated name with uh, when it came to distribution in terms of both yards and t- in touchdown passes, um, this year specifically, he's emerged almost like a phoenix out of the ashes um, because it, you you almost don't even recognize who he is in comparison to a year ago. As much credit as I'd love to say, oh well, the addition of Stephon Diggs is is why he's here. Any fantasy player will tell you that's not the case. Um, again, even the stat that I brought up when it came to distribution in decision making, uh, I, I, the, now some of the games here have been against inferior opponents. Um, I will say that, but what he's been able to do again when you, when you're talking about the Jets and, and the Dolphins, uh, that's not necessarily a, you know screaming uh, great football team but you have to give credit where credit's due when it comes to decision making and the ability to to be consistent and win games so i i will say he's definitely emerged as uh someone that you will be paying attention to for the rest of the year uh, absolutely and if they do not win this division that that will be uh absolutely a, a disappointment and and in truth it'd be in a point, catastrophe be a knock against against him specifically oh you say it won't be a knock against him specifically no i said it will be absolutely oh, yeah. he will be held accountable for that because yeah. see what i'm looking for is there's he's in two weeks he plays kansas city measuring stick game he's going to play new england in a few weeks after that then he gets seattle then you get Arizona, then you get San Francisco, then you get Pittsburgh, and then you know again. Then you're going back to Foxborough. Mm-hmm. That's when you know again all of this stuff starts to catch up to you. Because right now, as you pointed out in in programs of past, we didn't have a preseason. So through four weeks here, 
technically this would be going into week one where teams would have quote unquote figured it out. They have enough stuff on tape. They understand tendencies, you know, who's unless they're the Cowboys, of course, where, you know, they're just a, a bunch of stop signs out there defensively. Mm-hmm. But uh, anyway, I, <laughs> for the rest of the league, this is where, you know, it, you're going to really make a name for yourself. So I still believe the jury is out, but I will not take away his accomplishments through these first few games. Yeah, he's looking pretty sharp. That defense is suspect, too, though, the Bills. Um, overall, they give up a lot of passing yards. I forget the number. Gully, uh, the, you know, we come to you now, of course. Is Josh Allen for real in your estimation? Yeah, I have no reason to uh, believe he isn't. Uh, he's only continued to get better as years uh, went along. I think maybe the expectation was for him to be the uh, the face of the, league, of the league or something like that. Maybe um, expectations were a little, uh, let's say, a little um, out of whack in a sense. I can't say overrated or underrated. I just think they, they, were, they were a little misguided. But what I see from them, in four games, the team is undefeated. They're beating teams that they're supposed to be the way they should be. Meaning, you know, if a, if a team has a soft schedule, but they dominate that soft schedule, it certainly should make a case that that team is better than people would like them to believe because they played a soft schedule. That being said, they're undefeated, and uh, most re- most recently, they went against a, a Las Vegas Raiders team that's actually pretty good as well. And uh, he looked he looked darn good doing so. He's been uh, efficient with the ball. He's been airing it out, and uh, he's got a high completion percentage. Those are all the numbers, but not. But seeing them play and watching them play, composure, things like that. Think the marks of the marks of a of a of a good quarterback, a great quarterback, elite quarterback. Those things are there. And uh, like you said, the Double J, uh, if they start to show, we, we can start holding him accountable for being able to play at a higher level because he has the potential. That, that's that poison word. He's shown it now um, through four weeks, and he's shown it year over year. So, yeah, I think he's the real deal. Yeah. Uh, should they make the playoffs, though? That's a whole different animal for a guy that ain't never been there, especially in the NFL. And you know what else? is something else that kind of stood out to me. I watched a few games Sunday. I was able to get up at a decent hour to catch a few of the games. Not having fans in the stands seems to be more, I don't know the word I'm looking for, but it's it's funny when it comes to the NFL. I mean, you could get away with it in the NBA. It's open gym. You know what I mean? You don't really have to have people there. You know, just sneakers squeaking on the, on the hardwood. <clears throat> but to not have fans, and I've seen a couple of cases, of course, oh, and, and to the Browns' credit, they're going to allow, if I'm not mistaken, either 11,000 or 12,000 people, I believe, for this next game with the uh, with the Colts, 12,000 people. Strike while the iron is hot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Get it while it's hot. Yeah, 12,000 people should be in, a, in, a, in attendance. But for a few of the games, I, I saw no fans whatsoever, not even the cardboard cutouts. And I was like, wow, man, for them to be playing on a 100-yard field and nobody in the stadium but the cameraman, that's – you know, that's just looked odd. It just will seem odd to me. And then the last game of our three games to watch is none other than the Colts, who are 3-1, and one, at Double J and Brother Richard's beloved elf, brownies, dogs, whatever you want to call them, you seeing how they're a new team, who are also 3-1. and one. And the question is, Double J, we'll come to you first on this one. Unbiasedly, please, thank you very much. What are we to make of this Browns team? Seeing how y'all couldn't save it, you know, till we got to this part or whatever it is. You and Brother Rich just had to, you know, on your mark, get set, go. But anyway, yeah, go. Well, cue Dennis Green. They are who we thought they were. Defensively, vastly improved. You lose. What are you talking about Q Denny Green? Chuck, How about Parcells? You are what your record says you are. How about that? Oh, uh, here here we go. Now look. Remember those uh They three and one. You are what your record says you are. That's all I'm saying. You said Q Denny Green. 
Denny Green don't get. Listen, we Bill Parcells on this show, baby. The Giants. NFC East is the best division in football. I'm sorry. Did you, were you saying something? Go ahead. <laughs> Continue. Well, not from what we've seen last Sunday, that's for sure. Hey. Uh, but nevertheless, back to our game here. Oh, game. All you right. know, when, when our host would send us articles to, the, to, to the, our listening audience here, he would send us things such as Odell Beckham go, rumored to be traded in the next few days. Fact. This is not, oh, here's how the the offense is going to explode this year. No, it was how the team was going to implode. And instead, the only thing blowing up is everyone's plan for for the Browns to not be in the playoffs, like our host here. So instead, the most fraudulent team by far this season has been the Indianapolis Colts. They barely beat a, a Bears team that, you know, it could be, com- barely complete a pass <clears throat> from what I had seen Sunday. Uh, the, the Colts were no better offensively. Phillip Rivers looks like he retired last year, and they just throw him out there, and, and the guy can't throw more than 10 yards. Uh, most of his targets are going to the tight end again, right over the middle of the field. His career, he's done. He is done. Yeah. That's so, un- unfortunately, that's when you talk about a team capable of, of a shootout, like those boys in, in Texas that got mopped up and down there wow. last Sunday. But you know what? You know what's interesting? Because I'm, I'm going as as you're talking, I'm going through some of the, the threads that I, that I sent you and Brother Rich. You know the articles that you say I, I send and things of that nature implode and explode and all that other Willy Wonka type stuff. I seem to recall sending you all the Browns Cowboys predictions from local Cleveland media people who people who get paid big bucks to make predictions and prognostications and things of that nature, and not nary one of them. Not nearly one. Pick the Browns. Except me. I I told you on as many occasions here and Gully that that negative culture starts with that same media and fan base. But that, but I don't hear you all talking about them. I don't hear you all talking about them. Oh my gosh! Oh, who who's number four and number five in NFL history when it comes to uh, all time kickoff returns? Who sent you that? Who who sent you that from Sports Illustrated? Oh oh, it w- wasn't well, me, huh? That was because it was a it was from a, a, an uh, I, 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 a gentleman out of the U, uh, named Devin Hester. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, actually, I sent it because my boy, Eric Metcalf, and Josh Cribb. <laughs> okay? Hey, you know, here's a quick trivia. Who started the Wolf Wolf in the Dog Pound? Do you all know that? Who started that? That's what I thought. Gully. So, Jay. So, Jay. Yeah. So, Jay, you know these things. As I said, you're a sports. This is what you've done all your whole life. You're a sports professional. You know different things about sports oh. and everything. Oh. oh, now I'm a professional. You know peculiar okay. things. So, gotcha. So, no, that, that's just what you do. You're, okay. This is what you do. You're an analyst as it relates to sports. Uh-huh. So tri- that you know more trivia than us about the Browns does not mean, but you absolutely despise the Browns as a franchise. You that's not true. Objection. Via, via that's that not true. Program. Witness was. But here's the thing, Jay. Are you talking about the, the Dixon guy? The, from the the Lakeland Community College kid, I'm talking about Hanford Dixon. So, am, I, am I right there? Hanford Dixon. And it was the the. the was, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes, Hanford Dixon. The point I'm trying to make here is to dispute, with evidence, Double J and Brother Richards claim that the only thing I send them article wise when it comes to the Browns are things in reference to or would imply that they will implode. Matter of fact, here's here's another one. Well, this is dated September 30th, which is was a Wednesday. 
Here's something you both will get a kick out of. How Kevin Stefanski is transforming the Browns into one of the best red zone offenses in football. Film review. Who sent you that? I'm just saying, but I digress. Gully, were you saying something? You see what this is, right? You you, you see what these two. I, I definitely do. Yeah, you, you see what I'm saying? They trying to paint a picture. Yeah. Do you know I have people, the people who listen to the program, well, who walk up on me be like, you dirty Dallas cowboy. I'm like, what? But meanwhile, I'm, I got on a Miami Hurricane hat and a shirt. You de- you see what I'm saying? You They know that people don't read or can't think for themselves. Okay, so they listen to the folks on this platform, and all of a sudden, the thought, the seeds of thought have been planted. As a man thinketh, I think not. No, what no, were you saying, no. Gully? This is the same guy that said, you know, if Baker could be what Dak Prescott is and the Browns. Oh, that's all said, lies. Oh, that's it. lies. Oh my God. You know what, man? Uh huh. Oh, you don't oh, really. You you need to, brother Richard. You need to hand him your pooper scooper. Go ahead, Gully. What were you saying? <laughs> This is outlandish. The, right. I, I just want to, first of all, just capture, like, today's October 6th. We've got the Denny Green reference, and we've got the Bill Parcell reference, specifically as it relates to the Cleveland Browns. I just want to capture this in the time capsule. We have to revisit this in, the, in, in, in week 17. We have to revisit this, because this, this is a very telling moment. The yeah. Browns. Should, if they're doing what you guys say, say they're doing, Brother Rich and Double J, they should not really have a problem with the Colts, uh, the way that they handled the Cowboys until the fourth quarter when they allowed 24 points. But then, again, that's me being pessimistic or maybe just being observational. No, but, hey, but let me um, tell you this right quick. I'm, I'm putting it out here right now. They, the Browns won't have a problem with the Colts. Philip Rivers is what everybody thought Tom Brady was going to be at 73. Go ahead, Gully. Continue. Well, see, that's the – I don't know. I mean, they're still – still Man, Philip Rivers is – Philip Rivers, is, Phillip Rivers is terrible. You terrible. You mentioned about his yards were – Terrible. You, you mentioned about uh, yards, yards versus uh, per attempt. I mean, if we just look at the stats, there's the stats and then there's the story. And the story is you get what you, what you get when you watch the game. Statistically speaking – Philip Rivers' yards per attempt this season is above his career average. And actually, yeah, it's, it's in the upper echelon of his career average. So it's, a, it's more than half, it's, more, it's better than more than half of the years he's been in the league. So they might be to the tight end. Maybe he's just coming back to, you know, uh, back to the era of um, him having Antonio Gates, you know what I mean, um, has a reliable option to pass to. That being said, well, Kelly, to your point, it, you, you're absolutely right here about his his weapon now justin herbert showing that it, over in la that he had weapons but he couldn't get them he couldn't reach them with with the way he w- can distribute the ball at this stage of his career he has three tight ends to choose from between mo alley cox jack doyle and trey burton so that is a a very much a trifecta they are a very uh they they're very much a professional Wisconsin football team. Uh, it, the way that, it, as you know, Wisconsin is, is old school, ground and pound, short passes, position yourself to, to manage the, the game and the clock itself by getting, you know, just by simply working the numbers to your advantage um, and, and positioning yourself to, to make very short third down conversions. Additionally, why is he also having this success? I talked about defense. Their defense is not being talked about enough, and this is why it, I mentioned if somehow Cleveland can get off to a quick start, they will run away with that game because the way that Indy is set up, they are not set up to, to play uh, catch-up by any means. They yeah, hold it, hold it, hold it. Every game that they play, all that, all of that. Defensively, they have given up less than a thousand yards, Jay. Okay, listen. All of that sounds fine and dandy. I'm talking about Philip Rivers, and I'm talking specifically about patterns, especially when it comes to him. If you go back and look at his time in San Diego or with the L.A. Chargers or whoever it is. My Bobby Doyle, Dan Fossil, whoever else, Lionel Little Train James, anybody else you want to throw in there and say he had or he didn't have, that's all fine and dandy. 
But with with San Diego or with the Chargers, it was either they the Chargers would start off fast during the season and fade late, or vice versa. And he was the centrifugal figure in all of that. Now, yeah, he puts up numbers, and I ain't, I'm not calling him no bum, and I'm not going that far with it. I'm talking. I'm looking at the pattern of Philip Rivers on the on the football teams that he's on. He will throw interception after interception, and then throw two or three touchdowns, then, then, then and then this team will be two and four, and then they'll win five straight, and then or either they'll be four and one and lose six straight, and then, ah. That's the pattern with that he's guy, a, and that arm is noodle. It's noodle. So the, it sounds like the pattern that he has is that uh, he likes to paint himself into a corner and then paint himself out of it. Yeah, just like Andrew Luck used to do. And I liked Andrew Luck, but Andrew Luck would, would – that's why I don't talk sports from a fandom perspective. It's strictly from a philosophical. See, there's a concrete basis when you do it – from a philosophical. Andrew Luck was good, nice. He was tight. I I would hate to see the retired and all that good stuff. On one end, the conversation was always about how many fourth quarter comebacks he had. I said, but what y'all leaving out is the fact that he the reason why they had to always come back in the fourth quarter. Now go look up them statistics. And that's not no knock on Andrew Luck. Let me reiterate that. Because some folks, I'll give you another word with start with art, like to run away with stuff. I am not knocking. I'm knocking Phillip Rivers. I am. But Andrew Luck, I'm not. What I'm saying is, if we're going to have this conversation about a guy, let's talk about the thing that you can point to that no matter how long he's been in the league, that thing is constant. And the pattern with him is, like I said, they either his team start early and fade late, or vice versa. Now tell me I'm lying. A lot of things I say here on this platform, people can disagree with, and they disagree with all day, every day. Ah, that's fine with me. But am I telling a lie? Well, but, but they, it, it, you're, you're correct in your analysis about his career. The difference this year is that he has been very much a game manager where he has not been forced into either old habits, whether good or bad, or situationally via the score. So things out of his control, such as the defense giving up X amount of points in, in a you know, very small window of time, even in the only game that such a thing took place, and it was late in the game. So again, even, even under those circumstances, it didn't take place till late was the week one in Jacksonville, in which case he went right back to the Phillip Rivers of old and threw a late interception that sealed the victory or defeat. A leopard case. don't change his spots. That is why. Just because he changed uniforms. Him. Yep. A leopard don't change his spots. That's what I'm trying to tell you. He might be a game manager, but he cannot help himself. And I will use a boxing Reference. How many times have we seen what was the the, the 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 boxing trainer, the famous boxing trainer that passed a few years ago? Manny Stewart. I heard Manny Stewart once say, Yeah, you can teach a guy how to throw a jab, you can do this, this, this. but when he get in that ring, he's gonna revert, revert he gonna revert right back to his old it's coming. It's coming with Phillip Rivers. He's doing what he's doing for now. He's managing the game now. He can't help himself. It's in him somewhere. He's gonna have to let loose. He got a cowboy, <laughs> excuse the pun intended, mentality. He's a gunslinger. You can't keep right. a gunslinger down. He's a gunslinger. He's going to have to sling it. And he has been, he has cost his team games that just the hair scratchers. They are. And but even though he's going in the Hall of Fame most likely because he got over how many passing yards he got in his career? 642 million or something like that. I mean, you know. I mean, you know, I, I know he getting in. If they talk about Vinny Testaverde getting in with 42,000 passing yards, I know Phillip Rivers is getting in. But like you said, when uh, Gully said, excuse me, when you – the tail of the tape, when you turn the game on, you man, Phillip Rivers will have a 21 to nothing lead in the fourth quarter and you go to the bathroom and come back and the Chargers then lost 28 to 20 – I mean, 30 to 28. 
You know what I'm saying? I don't know what it is, but it's just something about Philip Rivers. I want to say overrated. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry about that. Mm. Hey, a little something. I need to take a sip of water. Brother Rich, unbiasedly please, because we still have a few things left yet to get to. What are we to make of this Browns team? Well, unbiased. Well, making this, of this can team, you do this, that? This can you do that? Maturity. I don't. Can you be I unbiased? Can, can you? Can absolutely do it. Oh, okay. Let's this see. Is a Let's team see. That's reaching its prime maturity. It's NFL. It's grown up in NFL years. It's three years in. We have a mature Miles Garrett, a mature Baker Mayfield. We have stability in the coaching staff, the front office. We have a, what appears to be some semblance of a direction of where the team and the franchise is going that appears to be stable for, for the first time in his 20-year childhood. You know, we, we're going into adulthood now. We're growing up in NFL years. And so now you see a team w- that is performing on the field like the draft picks finally are maturing and as, as we anticipated they were. And as Double J so beautifully said, they are who we thought they were. This is the team that we thought would upset many teams on Sunday and that they would surprise many people. We thought we would arrive last year. But unfortunately, we uh, Baker got a little ahead of himself. With a, he got a little too far out there. Miles got a little. The team felt itself a little bit too much. OBJ had a little adjusting he had to do. But now the team is adjusted, and we're there now. We had a humbling experience last year, and we're here now. And so we are who those of us who are fans of the team and not relying on old history and old hats and just trying to put whatever Jerry Jones. Oh, don't be, don't, ho, 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 ho. Don't be so dismissive. You know, don't be so dismissive with history no, 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 when no, you're no, trying no, to make no, a point, no, but no, then no, when no, you're no, trying no. to make another point, your history is okay to use. Come on, cut that out. But I'll tell you this. I'm saying, I'm saying, that, I'm saying that the team the team has matured. The team is here Okay, now. yeah, yes, okay, yeah. Just leave, yeah, leave, it, leave it right there. I'll tell you what, though. Stefanski is calling the plays, but guess whose plays there are that he's calling? I'll let y'all look it up. <laughs> yeah. That's whose plays that he calling. And if I'm if and the last thing on this, uh, before we move on to our uh, three burning questions, correct me if I'm wrong, Brother Rich. Did not somebody say on this P. Rogram mm, something about the duration, or excuse me, not the duration, how long it takes before you can really grade a draft? Didn't somebody say that? You did say that. Said I, 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 I said that. Did, said did, that. Did, did I not say that before? I, Why everybody asked that. me, man, what you Which get a bronze draft grade? That, I can bring up that argument again today in response to the question you asked. That's exactly why I was able to bring that up and say that to you and the audience and to all everyone. That's exactly what we all understand now, that it takes that long to at least grade the draft. And we are now able to say, look at the Browns. They are who we thought they were. Okay. That's why I say when it comes draft time, I don't do draft grades. Okay? I know they're getting the big bucks, Mel Kuyper yeah. and Todd McShay. I actually like Todd McShay. But at the end of the day, I am not going to rely on a guy who does a mock draft every other week, and that mock draft every other week that he does changes for the most part. You, you're wavering. But you expect me to put a wager <laughs> down on your wavering? Not going to happen. If you're up and around, you're out and about, and you want to give us a shout, that number to call is area code 267-687-0026. Once again, the number to call, area code 267-687-0026. And as always, we are powered by, or the shot report is powered by, <clears throat> excuse me, the fine folks over at Rocket Digital Media. It's the one-stop shop for all your digital marketing needs. Okay, three burning questions. <clears throat> excuse me. Gully, we'll come to you with this one. Now, you all know what I do for a nine to five, right? Every now and again, yes, sir. I'm doing what I do at my nine to five, and I'll see a publication. There's a lot of sports publications that come through, right? USA Today, Sports Illustrated, Athlon, Street and Smith. I didn't even know they still had Street and Smith. If you can find your Street and Smith magazine, particularly, well, I don't know how they're doing it now with the COVID, but if if we if anything gets back to any normalcy, like with college basketball, <clears throat> excuse me. Always get a good a Street and Smith NCAA basketball preview and an NFL preview. They're pretty good. They are. But anyway, uh, this one particular publication that I that I came across, the USA Today, they had Seahawks signal caller Russell Wilson on the on the front page. 
and they kind of asked the question or made the statement. I don't know how you want to put this. I try to put it in a question form. But USA Today, oh, excuse me, I'll put it this way. Is the Seahawks, and Brother Rich, we stand with you, is the Seahawks' Russell Wilson the ultimate, quote, unquote, game ender and closer? USA Today seems to think so. What do you say, Brother Rich? Uh, is Patrick Mahomes in the league? But, yes, I'll give, the, I'll give, I'll say Russell Wilson is as good. Yes, absolutely. Is. He's one of the ultimate, absolutely. Thank you. Brother Rich giving somebody else credit for something? Medic. <laughs> Medic. What the hell is going on out here? Gully, is the Seahawks signal caller, Russell Wilson, the ultimate game ender and closer? In your highly esteemed opinion. Ultimate? Hmm. Now you talking well trying to keep the question That's USA and, Today. And, they and, the USA yeah, Today seems to think so. I was just asking the question. <laughs> okay. Um you know what? I, I might sound like an echo chamber for uh brother Rich, but um outside of Mahomes, yeah, I, I certainly yeah, I think so. I I think it's about clutch and composure. Right, and I don't see where Russell Wilson is deficient in either, even in those moments. I don't right. see, and and I think that is the true mark of a closer: the performance, being able to get it done. You know, we that's what we've seen from Mahomes, and even in his young career, we've seen it at the we've seen it at a big level. Um, you know, I think so recently. You know what I mean? We got to go back a few years before we uh, think about uh, Russell Wilson being uh, that guy. They could bring his team, you know, add it to a Super Bowl. They should have just gave it to Marshawn Lynch. And I think really I, I, I throw that in there anecdotally, but I think that to me, that decision is a – I can't dismiss that decision when you're talking about waiting a guy has the ultimate closer. That was the time where you need to override whatever play calls you got. You follow me? And I think that decision, that's a big one. Maybe he grew since then. Mm, so I guess roughly speaking, yeah, he could be the ultimate closer. But I think there's a little room for argument there. I do too. And, but I just thought the way that they put it and posed it and it was written on the front of that cover. I said, oh, wow, this might be good to throw up other fellas on the show. Double J is the Seahawks signal caller. My man, Russ Wilson, the ultimate game in their quote unquote and closer. And again, USA uh, Today seems to think so. Yeah, using that terminology and, and that ver, ver, verbiage, here's where, again, I, I have to look at that. I, I will say right away, the pace that he is at this year is arguably the best of his career. Quarterback rating, number of touchdowns, yards per game, uh, absolutely, he's, he's on pace to shatter anything he had done, and he was no slouch beforehand. Now, regarding being a closer, he is tied for both of these stats. The fourth, uh, the most fourth quarter comebacks at 21 and game-winning drives at 27 since he entered the league in 2012. So based on those two facts that we just looked at, I cannot take it away from him. Again, as far as getting to the promised land, as we know, in years past, especially with him, we were fully aware of uh, his defense having its own uh, name and, and brand of its own being the Legion of Boom, and that's not necessarily all there at this moment in time. But when you, when you look on paper and you see what he's done and he's been consistent in what he's doing this season – but if the ball's in his hands, then, yeah, it's very, very difficult for me to say that he can't get it done. You know, I just, I just like watching the kid play, all jokes aside. He just strikes me as a consummate professional and person, man. You know, he'd he go about his business, man. No, he don't, he, he don't, he's not a look-at-me, look-at-me kind of player, you know. But you, you can't help but to see him because his plays, it, it, it do all the talking. 
Right. You know what I'm saying? And I, I'm, I'm right. you know, I always, you know, I'm always tip my cat to a cat like that. You know, you don't see this dude, you don't hear his name, and he don't get enough credit. You know, why everybody want to throw off the court or off the field stuff into the mix, into the pot of who we think this guy is, you know, based on our opinions or whatnot. You don't get enough credit if you ask me. You know what I mean? I like the dude. You know, he he's one of them stories, too. I believe he – did he walk on at Wisconsin? Do I have that right? Or am I mixing him up with Baker Mayfield? I know Baker had to walk on to a, a couple of spots. But I, I think early on in his – his football career, at least from a collegiate standpoint, Russ Wilson, you know, he, he wasn't handed the reins. He wasn't Matt Leinart. He wasn't the second coming of Pat Hayden and, you know, you know, any of these other top, top recruits. The guy had to work his tail off. And you can see that his, his work ethic, man, it's, it's second to none, man. You know, it's second to none, well, the, in my he, opinion. Uh, not to take anything away from him, he, if you recall, he transferred from North Carolina State to Wisconsin. That's what it was, right. Right, 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 he transferred. Yeah, so again, that, that doesn't mean, I, I'm sure there were conversations there, but, uh, you know, of course, Wisconsin got over the hump that year with him. Uh, and, and let's not, you know, say he was some kind of slouch or things were handed to him. Like, remember, this guy was drafted as a baseball player. Yeah. So, uh, and, and still, he wanted to, to fulfill that uh, opportunity as well. So, uh, you know, this was, regardless of how it played out with football, you know, he he was going to, to be at the highest level um, one way or the other. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's my dude, man. I like, I just, I like the guy. I like watching him play. You know, he precise. He just go about his business, man, like, Every possession matters, you know, and so much of that being lost on these professional athletes nowadays, but I won't get into that. And we will mention another guy I tip my hat to as well because he kind of uh, puts me in the same mind frame. But question number two of our three burning questions, Gully will come to you with this one. Is it time for the Indians to turn their managerial duties over to Sandy Alomar full time? And this actually is a two-part question. Will a team name change reverse the Indians' postseason misfortunes? Um, the name change is, is due, period. Um, but the, the problem that the Indians have in the postseason is a problem that plagues all of Cleveland sports in the postseason. And uh, I don't know that the name change is simply erase that. Um, is, is a solvent for that. I answered your second part first. Um, as far as your first part, is it time to turn over managerial duties to Alomar full time? Um, no, not yet. If if if, if Mr. Francona, um, if I'm not mistaken, he was battling. He was battling an illness. If, if, is that what took him out? Off the yes, side? he is. Um, yes, I and mean, he okay. he's doing a little bit better so, now, from my understanding, but. Yeah, you know his. Um, you know it might be time to have a conversation. But go ahead. Yeah. So assuming that it, if it's not health, if it's unless it's health, his grasp of the game, I think is still solid enough that um, I would I would hate to see him go elsewhere. I would hate the the Indians to move on from Terry Francona. But I think he is what the franchise needs if they're finally going to win a title. After so many years, not so with a decade, not with Dolan, them Dolans, boy. Anyway, my mama said, "But that's what nice, I'm saying." Nice it, to it, say about Barring nobody. Dolan, you know what I mean, right? Uh, and I think uh, uh, Mr. Lindor has something to say about that as well. Exactly, but, I was going there next. And, yeah, but but about Sandy Alomar, um, it would be great. You know, uh, we we always love. I mean, one thing about Cleveland sports, uh, I can't speak for everyone else, but I know that shocks you, uh, brother Rich and Double J, that I actually love a Cleveland uh, sports team. Man, don't pay them uh, no so mind. Hope, but 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 I I, I digress. Um, it, it would be great for a guy like Alomar, who I think has a very he has wisdom about the game. I mean, he played catcher, so he saw everything all the time. It'd be great for him to have his his you know, to be able to take the reins on in Cleveland. But I guess all, you know, to keep it short and sweet, if Francona's healthy, let Francona 
finish it out. I think he's got more to offer to the game. But if not, if you want to move on, don't let Alomar go anywhere else. Don't let him go to Chicago again uh, like he did when he was a player. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm with you on that. Brother Rich, is it time for the Indians to turn the managerial duties over to Sandy Alomar full-time? And will a team name change reverse their postseason misfortunes? Absolutely not time to turn the, the managerial duties over quite yet. As long as we have Sandy Alomar there, hold him in pocket, if they, and if they can make an arrangement for him to get an opportunity to get that. But I don't think that Francona should lose his job because of illness, if that's what we're talking about. Now, we're talking about if there's some problems with his player management skills, but we know that he's won. He's a winner. Um, and he's, uh, he knows the game inside out. So he's, he's a person that can bring along, even in the help make Sandy Alomar a better manager when his time comes to run the ball club. So from that point of view, no, that's not necessarily uh, a change that I could see happening for that reason. Mm-hmm. And with respect to the name change, however, I believe that we cannot just gloss over what you said, the way you laid the question out, that with respect to the name change, there are some questions as to whether they are not in the social climate that we're in, whether or not a team like that or the team in Washington who had to change its name because there are some social responsibilities that we're asking teams to look into today. So as a fan base, what are you asking and what are you saying? That's a political statement when you continue to, to use that name. So, yes, I think that needs to be done immediately. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's part of the problem that the team has at the post. Yeah, I think so, too. And the, the, some of the suggestions, well, one of the suggestions I like, they actually, they actually used to be the, the Indians' name in the early 20s and 30s, I believe. It was the Cleveland Spiders. And they had a picture of the uniform up. And uh, oh, okay. asking the question, I th- I think it'll be pretty good. You know what I mean? Why not? You know, change the name. Right. Yeah, change the name. Double J, is it time for the Indians to turn the managerial duties over to Sandy Alomar full time? And will a team name change reverse their postseason misfortunes? Beginning with Sandy Alomar. The, the difficulty is actually his personality and not in a negative way. It, it, uh, meaning it's not a Manny Ramirez type of uh, extroverted individual. Yeah, he's a nice he guy. Actually, by definition. Yeah. Yeah, he's a nice guy. I've heard that. He's too nice. He, he's too nice. And oftentimes for the role itself, especially interviewing as a candidate, I believe that his personality, almost that, that kindness can be taken as a weakness. And he, he has been on record, I believe, even in the last week, stating that basically if the opportunity falls into my lap, I will take it. Um, but he put himself out there on so many occasions that he even understands, he almost feels like, uh, it's the dog and pony show for, for him to go that, you know, uh, that he's not really getting a fair shot at a lot of these opportunities. Um, and to my knowledge, the, 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 the ball club itself has already came out publicly today and said Francona will be back next year. Now he's under contract for two more years, um, you know, through 2022. So, you know, a lot of that hinges on the success of, of next year. Obviously, they were a postseason club this season. Um, so it depends on maybe their own expectations that they have for the franchise. Um, but, of, of course, just swapping managers does not solve problems per se unless you were having truly managerial uh, decisions that were costing you the games themselves. That it, you know, because as Brother Rich pointed out, it's talent that ultimately gets it done. So I will say this. Do I believe Sandy Alomar will be a manager? Absolutely. But I believe that he will be a manager of a, of a different club, and that will actually bite the Indians in the long run. Yeah. Um, 
if they because of this decision that we're talking about today by deciding to bring Francona back for next season. Um, I felt that way personally when uh, initially when Francona was was let off the hook in Boston in the Tigers that made uh, a very similar decision with either uh, Leland or Osmus, and and it was one season too late, and you missed the right guy at the time. Now Cleveland obviously went to a World Series, you know, between you know in that period of time, and obviously has remained relevant uh, with with uh, with regards to you know you, just those those past seasons um, that have since taken place. So there is something to be said with the caliber of the manager itself. But again, that's where I believe he is, in my estimation, one of the first names on my short list. And as you just seen, Ron Gardenhire walked away, uh, unfortunately, due to health concerns that he did not wish to disclose. Um, so, so my heart and, and, and uh, thoughts and prayers are certainly with him and his family as somebody that, you know, it, it, like himself that has survived cancer in the past. Um, and, and ultimately here, I believe that, uh, he, you know, he may have to take that short hike, um, or, or just tr- trip over the lake, over Lake Erie there. Um, and he may find himself a new home. Yeah. You know, I was listening to a post game after the Indians got eliminated. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Lindor's comments stood out. They kind of confirmed what I've been mulling over in my head when I listened to I forget who the announcers were but they were saying that in that game I think the Indians lost like 10 to 9 or something it was a pretty good game the the elimination game but they were saying some of the moves that Alomar made had Tito been there he might he probably wouldn't have made and I forget it was a picture or whatever it is that he brought in too early or took out too late or something or another like that so there's still some growing pains, but I, 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 I'm in the same camp as you. I think that Sandy would make a good manager one day, just not right now. But if the Indians had to turn it over to somebody right now, I'd like for it to be him. I might have been on both sides of the fence with that one, but I hope you all get, get where I was trying to go with that. All right, and our last question for the evening, I'll let you all get back to your or get to your uh, NBA closeout finals closeout game this evening. Is Jimmy Butler's Game 3 performance more impressive given that he took no threes? And the stat line, if you're a stat person, for Jimmy Butler's Game 3 performance, 40 points, 13 dimes, and 11 rebounds. Brother Rich, is Jimmy Butler's Game 3 performance more impressive given that he took no threes? In today's NBA, I would have to absolutely say yes. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I must tell you that I was not among the. I was. I was among the many hundreds of millions that did not watch because I. I'm, I have decided not to participate in the NBA finals here. Uh, nevertheless, from when I read about the stat line and I heard about his performance, I too was impressed by the stat that the highlights I saw, and from what you told me uh, about him not having taken any threes in order to accomplish that, it makes it even more impressive. So. Looking that up, I thought that was even more impressive in today's NBA, where everybody is big men. You could be nine foot ten, and people are stepping back and shooting three. So <laughs> yeah. for him to have accomplished yeah. that with a mid range game is very impressive. Yeah, and you know we've had the conversation about the the volume of threes being taken in the NBA, the the, the wasted offensive possessions and style of play, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The ideology now is such that. It's so predicated on the threes, people are playing to percentages. Well, he shot 31% for three, or he shot 42% for three. This, 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 this. And it's so about that now. The other elements that usually are higher percentage are completely dismissed or forgotten. It's like guys don't even know how to do that anymore. When we put up that shot chart, and I've been showing that to people here lately, how I forget who put it together, how – and they just compared one year to versus one year. It was 2019-20 season compared to the 2001-2002 season or something or another. And they showed the two shot charts and how you saw red dots all throughout the 2000, you know, because that, that was still our era, so to speak, you know what I'm saying, where 
the utilization or, or more of the court was utilized in terms of scoring or attempts to score as opposed to the one, the graph in, in more recent. It was either, it was all or nothing. Either they were all out beyond the, the little de- red dots were all out beyond the three point line or right at the basket. But that in between area, that foul line, that mid range and all that area, it was completely blank. So people are saying, well, if he ain't shoot the three, this, no, the game don't have to be predicated on that. And Jimmy, to me, prove that he, he just gave us all a reminder there are still other ways you can get it done is my point double j is jimmy butler's game three performance more impressive given the fact that he took no threes you have to look at how the game is being played today as we are you specifically going it today ba Knowing that beat them the old school way, so to speak. Additionally, what makes it even more impressive is not just the offensive element, but the fact that he guarded the so-called king for the entire fourth quarter, meaning he was doing it on both ends, the amount of energy consumed. Again, he's without arguably his other top two players, um, on that roster in that particular game. And down 2-0, rises to the challenge, beats them, in my estimation, the right way. What more could you ask for? Oh, and meanwhile, gets the, uh, the you know, exposes the sore loser by walking off the court. Oh, yeah, we're not going to even, yeah, as, I'm not going to even, I'm glad you brought that up, but we're not going to even go into that, man. I've seen that. I, I've I've seen that so many times before. I just think it's just t- totally, totally disrespectful. Gully is Jimmy Butler's game three performance more impressive, given the fact that he took no threes. Would you take a million dollars if I offered it to you tax free? Uh, what's already understood? Need not even be asked. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. No question. You know what I'm mean, saying? No question. No, no question. <laughs> no question. Um, I also look at the fact that if you want to dive even, even more into the numbers, the fact that he was 14 of 20 shooting. Not only was it a high production, he had 20 shot attempts. And he, I mean, he only had 20 shot attempts and he made 14 of those. So he was remarkably efficient. Plus he got plus the way he got to the line, it should be a a a public service announcement that there are ninety four feet on a basketball court. Use them because you can probably win games. Thank you. Like you. I mean, uh, it's just I think the Lakers shot forty seven threes in that game. I mean, that's just. It, well, you you don't like no twos, and then you know that that old adage: threes to beat twos. Not if you're James Harden. Oh, my bad, man. Ooh, don't even, don't even get me started. We ain't got that kind of time. But yeah, I, I was impressed. I was impressed with Jimmy's performance. I saw pieces and bits and parts and so on and so forth of it. But when I saw that he didn't take no threes, I used that <laughs> as the, as my point of reference to all of them. You know them them three ball shooter, you know, chicks dig the long ball loving type fans. Man, go sit down. Look, I'm not saying that the three is a bad thing. I'm saying the volume. All right. But we don't know what, what the moderation don't exist no more. And to see guys pass up clean looks at twos, to look and see what a three-point line is just so they can get a three, that's bad for the game. Because guess what? Regardless of how which way you want to slice it, it's not a high-percentage shot. And at the end of the day, regardless of how they plan the game today, not regardless, excuse me, even though they plan the game today in the, at a 2K level or whatnot, isn't, isn't that the whole idea is to get a high-percentage shot? Isn't that still what the, 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 the nuance of basketball is supposed to be? Oh, <laughs> that's what I thought. 
Fellas, as always, that's some good stuff. I'm going to let y'all get on out of here, man, so y'all can go catch the closeout game of the 2020 NBA Finals. And on that note, it's been fun, but we got to run. We appreciate y'all for listening. Don't forget to check us out right here on Spreaker.com. Or you can check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Apple Music, Google Podcasts, and now iHeartRadio, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast and give us a follow. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, or you can hop on over to the shop's Facebook fan page. And if that don't work, Google it. For my mans, Bro Rich, Double J, D Gully, and all those who follow and support us, we say thank you. I'm Barbershop J, and you've been listening to The Shop Report. And remember, the next time y'all want to know what's really going on, man, come to the shop. Walk-ins are always welcome. Holla!